Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are discussing lore and practices of the Celtic world and how it lives on in the Ozarks. Whether you have Celtic ancestry or not, these oral traditions have impacted the world around you. We'll get back to that in a moment, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or about any other podcast platform. So what about these ancient beliefs might surprise people living in the Ozarks? I think that the answers really are very complex, but what we really cannot avoid is that a lot of these old ways will sound familiar to many people from the role of the land to water to death and even old conjuring ways that have found their way into everyday life. The truth is this ancestral lore is everywhere. We'll return to the question of how the ancient Celts live on in plain sight in the Ozarks. But first, we want to invite you to like, follow, and subscribe to Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as your favorite podcast platform. We also invite you to become a Dark Ozarks subscriber on Facebook. On the Dark Ozarks Facebook page, click subscribe, have your login information ready, and join Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 a month. Your $4.99 per month subscription allows you to come with us on paranormal investigations, deep dive research, and topics too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first run copy of the book, Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. Subscribe today to be entered in that drawing. And now you can get Dark Ozarts t-shirts for sale at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage you to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and at the website alwaysbuyingbooks.com. For all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, their building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm excited about tonight's episode. I am too. Um, of, co- of course, there's a, there's a lot of ancestry um, for us personally, as well as a lot of people who live in the Ozarks, a lot of the early settlers that go back to um, the Celts, uh, primarily via the British Isles. And yes. um, a lot of the traditions of of the Celtic peoples are particularly their mythology uh, and some of the rituals, etc., are a bit vague or, or unknown um, because there wasn't a written language early on. And a lot of the, the Celtic peoples were basically assimilated by the Romans fairly yes. early. So the traditions and in, in and parts of the mythology that, that we have received really come for the more come from the more isolated areas, i.e., the, the Isles, particularly from Wales, Cornwall, um, Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Maine, generally. <clears throat> they really do. And as we were able to go in on a very recent previous episode about the Scots Irish. That is where a great deal of our folkloric or on the ground influences of sometimes and oftentimes without realizing it, uh, direct ties to Celtic mythology come in. And I find that really fascinating. And as with so many things with the Celts, and I say so respectfully and lovingly as someone with a great deal of Celtic heritage, and I know you have a great deal of Celtic heritage as well, is that 
you really have to embrace this extreme duality um, in the the approach of the lore and the approach of the history. So, for example, with the Scots Irish, the the vast majority of Scots Irish, um, thousands of families coming over, <clears throat> the majority were devout um, Protestant Presbyterians. They mm -hmm. Uh, that this was that the uh, the Bible and the church were guiding forces in uh, their their personal lives and their their uh, their the development of their communities, the development of these mountain communities. You cannot go to a mountain community without having a church planted there. Um, you know, originally in rough hewn log, and then in in comparatively short order, uh, sawmill, white clapboard siding so on and so forth and yet we have pre-christian celtic mythology infusing the folk customs of these very same people very much so and and as and has happened um in large part in europe generally um the the Christian religion and the more modern belief systems were, were planted down over the older belief systems. And from the top down, they may not have realized it to begin with, but the ordinary folk continued their beliefs and just incorporated, um, I guess, um, for a modern comparison, example would be uh, voodoo, which brought West African religious and traditions and incorporated Catholicism. I think that's a, I think that's a very astute comparison, obviously with different people groups to a large degree, but it is interesting. And with this, <clears throat> something that I find really mm, for me, very personal and very beautiful, is that so many of the Celtic settlers, the Celtic immigrants, mainly across the Atlantic, um, were not individuals of high degree. They were not the gentility in so many cases. They were not, uh, in many cases, individuals with uh, a lot of wealth. They were 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 coming for land. Uh, mm -hmm. They were coming, but not in many cases, not the idea of grand plantation. They were not coming for uh, extraordinary wealth. They were coming for the opportunity to have their small piece of land that presumably no one could ever take away from them. Exactly. And, um, but again, the, the, the connection with the land and community is something that is present throughout the the mythos of the Celts. It is. It, it truly, truly is. And the understanding in many cases, and of course this informs the uh, sort of the, the anti-hero rogue mythology of um, Western civilizations, the past of our European forebears, but the idea, for example, of Robin Hood hunting the king's deer, um, mm -hmm. the, um, and, and this also heavily informs the Celtic migration patterns, which ultimately push the Celts into Appalachia, into the Ozarks. The idea that on some level, my clan and I have sovereignty unto ourselves. Yes. And uh, that notion comes through in symbolism and mythology uh, to a large extent. And um, maybe we want to start off with the, the role of water. Yes. <clears throat> it's, and I think starting with the Ozarks and then working backwards, <clears throat> it reminds me very much of an experience I had 
uh, back in the winter of 2009. Cannot believe it's been that far, that long. But uh, very early on in my working with Dale uh, Grubaum mm -hmm. as a uh, publisher of State of the Ozarks, but we were also on the, the collective story beat. And we did what we still affectionately refer to as the mill tour. We had found a list of still standing Ozarks mills and we went to go find them. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this led us to a number of locations, uh, most notably uh, Klebzig Mill, Alley Springs, Turner Mill and Turner Springs, um, uh, Falling Spring Mill, those those would uh, Rock Bridge um, and Zanoni uh, and Greer's Ferry, Greer's Spring and uh, <clears throat> Greer's Mill and Greer's Spring uh, on the, right there at the current river. And so in the 11 point, so uh, and the Jack's Fork Spring and the other Jack's Fork Spring and Blue Spring and then the other Blue Spring. Um, <clears throat> So it was a it was a busy like maybe five days and mm -hmm. uh, some rather uncomfortable motel rooms uh, and uh, it was not a high budget trip but it was memorable <laughs> and amazing and it was my first real foray into what I affectionately know as the real Ozarks and. <clears throat> there, are, it, there, there's, there's, there's degrees of engagement of the Ozarks, um, and when you are <laughs> have uh, taken a, a forest road and then turned off of the forest road and then wound down the side of the mountain to get to Turner Spring, you've arrived in the real Ozarks. So. <clears throat> I'm originally a flatlander. I'm originally, we had, for example, we had several springs on our farm. Mm -hmm. And for me growing up in, uh, in, in Illinois, in central Illinois, a spring meant a soggy spot in the dirt. Yeah. That uh, there's way I've too seen springs like that. <laughs> there was, I know that we had a, uh, we had a spring in the corner of our pond, which was very fortuitous. And it was a seepy spot. And uh, mm -hmm. it's where the frogs like to hang out. And uh, it was also the area that in the middle of summer, the, uh, the water in that section was just a little bit cooler than it was in the rest of the pond when you were swimming in it. So these were the types of springs that I was used to. And Turner Spring and uh, Turner Spring was my first example, my first engagement, my first encounter with a real spring. And to be in the midst of the Ozarks forest and walk around the corner, have this imposing limestone bluff towering over me in the winter sunset and suddenly realize that this, I do have to say magical, and crystal clear spring water is bubbling out from beneath the rock itself. It is bubbling out from underneath trees that have grown up in the rock. It is the, these tiny streams are pouring down. The moss is so green. Uh, the, the watercress is so abundant. It is like stepping into a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, there, there were multiple times, multiple times in the short four days that me at the time, an, an unadapted Illinois flatlander was wandering around going, I'm standing in Middle Earth. This is officially <laughs> Middle Earth. This is, um, <laughs> And I, I was I, I was like a like a little kid again, but it was and is magical, and it really highlights just you know we we are so used to water. We turn on the tap, we get water. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We have lakes, we have uh, man-made reservoir lakes, we have impoundments, we have all of these things. I grew up where water was muddy, um, where water was wide, where rivers were comparatively slow moving, um, <laughs> where they were full of barge traffic. And suddenly I was exposed to this idea uh, that water was somehow truly magical, truly associated with the Fae. Uh, connecting back to something ancient and powerful. And I'll never forget it. No, uh, space like that is always a bit magical and and, and it, it really um, captures the feel of a lot of the, the legends of the Celts. Um, I, 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 I'm always fascinated with the connections between water and death and the other world. Um, and uh, a lot of the topics that we end up talking about come into play there. Um, and, you know, there's some similarity to say that, that the Greek uh, tradition, et cetera, as far as water being a boundary and so on and so forth to the other world. But um, with the Celts, you know, particularly in some of the Irish myths, um, death basically creates that uh, boundary, actually the, uh, the digging of a grave um, will cause um, a lake or river to burst forward. And that space is connected with the other world. And, um, but it is the act of the, of the grave digging that creates it, which is, I think, rather unique in mythology. It does seem to be. And <clears throat> if not completely unique, <clears throat> Certainly, its emphasis in Celtic mythology stands out. Mm -hmm. To me, there, there's something, and this is mm, unique, I feel, or, or particularly special and associated with living an agrarian life. And the Celts were uh, agrarian warrior clans. Mm -hmm. And when you do live on a farm, when you do live, if not in harmony, certainly in close proximity to the natural world, you get more tuned in to how the world around you works. Mm -hmm. It is vastly less controlled, but there are moments that you, you witness, moments that you're exposed to in which intuitively you know that you've crossed some sort of boundary. Mm -hmm. it, it might be mm, the way that the the way that the birds are acting. It might be uh, watching the ripples on the water. It might be the way the sky looks. And of course, a lot of this is associated with weather lore, which is easy to dismiss. A lot of this, we still have ties. Uh, in the old almanacs and the republication of almanacs in that idea. Mm -hmm. But in terms of once, and perhaps this is why the, the Celts for so long did not have a written language, it is easier, I feel, to quantify these things in a fluid and dualistic process than it is to put it down on paper, where you put it down on paper, it might not always happen. But when you're experiencing it, you know when it's happened. I, 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 li I like that, that um, interpretation. Um, I do think there is something to that because once you commit it to stone, to ink, um, it becomes its own representation. And then um, 
the idea of the other or duality diminishes because it is already said. It does. And, you know, as a, as a point counterpoint that I would, would put out, you know, the, the old weather lore, red sky in, mor in morning, sailors take warning. And mm -hmm. in presumably in some areas of the world, particularly seacoast, et cetera, that might be a hard and fast rule here in the Ozarks and elsewhere in the Midwest, uh, Middle America. It's anybody's guess. That's very true. <laughs> it's uh, the weather patterns here are erratic and intrusive, and it's very difficult to to change. So you put it on paper, and then it's easy to look at that and say, "Oh, well, they didn't know what they were talking about." And in many cases, and as we'll deal with in terms of really digging into the mythology and the folklore, um, not only in this episode but in episodes to come. It depends heavily upon one's personal experience within space. And yes. a, a counterpoint to that that I just remembered uh, ages ago now, um, before I started to at the Ozarks, I could look up the date mid early 2000s. Um, I remember hot, still summer evening. I'm exhausted because of course I am. And I'm home in Illinois. I take a moment, I lie down on the couch. I'm the only one on the farm at that, that day and that night. I'm lying on the couch. The windows are open and uh, the back kitchen windows, the dining room windows were enshrouded in trumpet vine. Okay. And birds like to nest in the trumpet vine. And I'm lying there on the couch and I suddenly become aware that the birds don't sound right. They're making noises. There is an mm -hmm. agitated quality. I cannot explain it. I just know that how the birds normally sounded or would have sounded, it was different. And it was unsettling. It was obvious they were agitated. There was something weird about it. And I took note. It was weird enough that I took note mm -hmm. and then as I was a little more aware and a little more intuitive, there was just a, an odd electricity in the air that was, was hard to pinpoint. <clears throat> uh, I originally chalked it up to the high humidity, and then I chalked mm -hmm. it up to possibly a barometric pressure change. And at two o'clock thereabouts the next morning, uh, I am awakened by the very strange sound of the front porch creaking. I'm assuming it's because we're having a severe weather issue. I look and I hear the house creaking, but my curtains are not moving in the open windows. And mm -hmm. about 10 or 12 seconds later, it felt as though somebody had picked my bed up about three inches and dropped it. And it was an earthquake. Oh wow! So that so they sensed what was coming in the energy, in the yes. air or something. Very interesting. <laughs> my my one and only earthquake that I was conscious of. Yeah, I, I we've actually had some here that I, I was not conscious of. So I've been through some, but. Not that I knew. I, 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 I was through one when I was quite young and I was busy playing in the backyard or back porch with mm -hmm. my uh, recently acquired gray plastic dinosaurs from the Forest Park Nature Center. Um, and I was not aware that it had happened, but the one in the early 2000s, I was very aware and uh, scared the hell out of me. I can, I can appreciate that, <laughs> especially being woken up in the middle of the night with it. Just to, uh, I'm just, I'm just, it's neither here nor there, but to hear the sounds as though the house were, was being buffeted by extremely high winds, but zero wind. Yeah. 
that was absolutely freakish. And and again, coming back to uh, you know the, the the connectivity and uh, with the natural world, with the I would I would also contend the metaphysical world that mm -hmm. surrounds the natural world, and realize that there are there are things that we're dealing with, things that we're interacting with on all sorts of levels, that quite frankly the uh, clinical qualities of the written word, no matter how poetic, do not fully interpret. Agreed. Um, and just while we were talking, one thing that came, came to mind with, from this um, discussion is the, I, the idea of, of, of the grave digging being this catalyst to all of this. Um, I wonder if that is sort of a trace memory um, idea that informs us to be so unsettled by the idea of, say, a cemetery uh, submerged in a lake or something along those lines. Um, because if you look at it from the viewpoint of you've written it down, technically nothing's changed. The cemetery is there, it's undisturbed, but we are unsettled by it. We are, that's a really interesting point. And it does, it is a reminder of Things that happened both in the in, in Europe, uh, Wales specifically, uh, there was uh, ancestral lands in Wales that were uh, impounded and uh, mm -hmm. and flooded, I, ironically to make uh, electrical power available in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> and and there are not only villages, but of course, churches and churchyards and graveyards that were mm -hmm. submerged in that process, bringing, coming back over here, um, Lake of the Ozarks, Table Rock mm -hmm. Lake in particular. Um, there is, of course, you know, a great deal of PR effort, and public effort in terms of moving graves. Now, the truth of the matter is, when uh, Table Rock Dam neared completion, it started to rain and Table Rock filled up a lot faster than they were intending. Uh, mm -hmm. There are graves that were inundated. There are graves beneath the waters of Table Rock Lake. And there is something that is oh, viscerally unsettling about that, although we can't say why. Exactly, and, and with the Lake of the Ozarks, the, um, some of the, there were, at least, I think it's at least seven cemeteries that there, there was no attempt to, to move or, or anything. Um, so, but, you know, from, from a purely practical point of view, you could view it as that they are, in case they're, they're preserved by virtue of being covered. Um, yes but it's something that is so unsettling and um, it, it makes me think of, of, the, of the legend of, of uh, the burial of the wizard in ancient Ireland, which made you, which I, I, I really think is probably a source um, myth for Arthur in his burial um, in the middle of the lake. That's powerful and interesting. It's, of course, for people who are deeply unsettled by this, just look at it as a burial at sea in several parts. <laughs> You got buried and you added the sea. 
Well, burial at sea, depending on, on, on what's in the water, could be in parts as well. Uh, very quickly. It's it. It also reminds me. There's a. Uh, I've seen photos. I'd love to go visit sometime in the Netherlands. There is a, a historic park dedicated to the Celts. It's essentially a, um, a, a Celtic village and in mm-hmm. um, spaces. And there, there's a particular, a handful of particularly evocative photos because there's a dark pool of water. And then mm. at the water's edge, there are uh, hand hewn stakes basically making you know three point stakes with horse heads hanging from the stakes above the water actual horse heads yes interesting and representation of kelpies <laughs> it's definitely you know the, the the scottish water horse the the, the celtic kelpie um and and i think although uh, the goddess has a a Romanized name of Epona. There's mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the 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 Celtic horse gods and goddesses also being associated with the other world. The fact that not just water, uh, but forest pools were seen as portals into the other world. True, as as were wells. Yes. And I love uh, love the, the 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 well motif. I love the well. It, you could almost say religion that has built up around it, the traditions that have built up around it. And oh, yeah. this this is something that you can't walk through the doggone mall without noticing that it has continued to this day, because you throw pennies in the in the in the fountain. That's true for for luck. <laughs> And that really is, you know, we they're, they're from a, from an archaeological standpoint, um, what we know of the ancient Celts, approximately 700 BC and 500 BC, uh, respectively, uh, comes from two dominant archaeological excavations that took place in the 19th century. One mm-hmm. in Hallstatt, uh, Austria, in the Austrian mm-hmm. Alps. And the other uh, in actually Lake Neuchâtel in Switzerland. And yes. these have their, there's approximately 200 years of development between them, uh, quote unquote progress. And what we know from these two excavations have really defined what the modern world has come to understand for the Celts. And the excavation locations have become the, the the naming process for these two eras of uh, Celtic civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hallstatt being the first one uh, and Laten, uh, L-A-T-E-N-E, Laten for what was brought out of the, the lake. It was interesting because it was a treasure trove that came out of the Swiss lake, the Chateau, and the treasure trove was a sacrifice not pennies dropped into the fountain, um, mm-hmm. but a treasure hoard uh, of gold and silver that was given to the lake mm-hmm. and not found until the 19th century. And this is from whence we understand so much about uh, particularly the aesthetics of Celtic art. That's, that's true, it is the main source. But and, um, and it's and oh, it's in the lake. It's in or, yeah, it's in the lake. <laughs> and, it's not anymore. and yeah, <laughs> which sometimes you you wonder if, 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 if what repercussions come from removing it. But but this this continued on um, in the British Isles, in some places up in, at least into the Middle Ages, with offerings at wells and springs. It did, and I, I find this practice absolutely fascinating. I think it is beautiful. And again, there's, it, it would be technically incorrect to refer to it as a, as a hillbilly practice, 
but if you if you cross reference the idea of the hillbilly with the 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 people who are closest to the land, the people who are most associated with the traditions of the past, the people mm -hmm. most likely to resist progress, the uh, the individuals who might give lip service to greater authoritarian structures, but at the end of the day, they're going to live their own lives by their own clan structures. Hillbillies <laughs> and the uh, the folk people, the 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 everyday people in uh, in the British Isles who for centuries in in the case of Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England were perpetuating the uh, the processes of these sacred wells I can't help but draw some comparisons there and then the of course the the clue the, the Clutie wells uh-huh and the was with um, basic offerings of cloth, cloth to for divination. Yes, and and for luck. Uh, and, and for luck. For, essentially, the idea <clears throat> it's uh, it's a point of respect. You you offer something in the hopes that you get something in return, even if it is simple as as simple as uh, goodwill and protection. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I find one you, a couple of aspects too that come out of this this part of the lore. One is that um, the idea that um, these bodies of water of water, whether it be rivers or springs or wells, even that um, they're not only a boundary with the the other world but a separate space and that the dead pass through but they may exist within in a different form and it's it's um, analogous to shape-shifting it is they, they continue on it is and something that I think it's very it's it's certainly something that's very helpful to inform us as we do paranormal investigations mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that i don't see enough of in my humble albeit correct opinion um uh, <laughs> i say that tongue-in-cheek i'm i'm a newbie when it comes to investigations <laughs> but i'm not a newbie when it comes to folklore history and something that is Mm, that I think we investigate at our own risk is taking the mindset of here's a box where does the uh, uh, where does the the um, the activity fit and right. usually uh, we have does it fit in the poltergeist box as though poltergeists were sort of their own breed uh, <laughs> of spirit like oh look it's a gazelle you have uh you have your of course you bring out the the black demon box to uh put things in that one depending on what it is the lights flicker if your eyes turn black goes in the demon box and keeps uh, it more entertaining what's that keeps it more entertaining it does it does it keeps you keeps you glued to the glued to the the device through the commercials yeah. and uh and then you have the uh, the presumed uh, ghosts of deceased relatives that goes in that box, ghosts of deceased famous people that goes in that box, uh, ghosts of, of, of deceased unknown people who may or may not have been referenced in your research library associated with the building that goes in that box. And then you go, okay, we're done. And First of all, very rarely does it do you stray outside of that. Uh, I think that, uh, say, for example, the Skinwalker Ranch work has actually been positive in forcing people to move into um, phenomena outside of those boxes. Uh, True. And I think that's very positive. At the same time, we then just begin to add 
I mean, you know, drag in a couple more cardboard boxes. Here's one that we can we can stick a skinwalker in. Here's one we can, you know, pop open and a UFO comes out like a surprise balloon. Uh, let me see what I did there with that. Anyway, the <laughs> it's been a long day, but <laughs> the the, uh, the the thing that I really love and in there are many aspects of ancient lore that really speak into this that we can gain uh, a great deal of appreciation for this larger certainly a paranormal world certainly a supernatural world but you could even take it as far as to say simply a metaphysical world the the world beyond the world or the world that is meta beyond our existent matter that we're aware of typically with our five sensors and mm -hmm. The, the this Celtic water lore and Celtic well lore really speaks heavily to this in the sense that there is this effortless crossover between phenomena. And so it, it could be the ghost of a dead ancestor. Mm -hmm. um, simultaneously, it could be the Fae. Mm -hmm. and that is not seen as contradictory that's true in this tradition it's not and i i find that really really beautiful it mm, reminds me honestly it reminds me a little uh of some individuals mm, experience of angels um yeah which, you know, in, in some cases is uh, a visitation by, by a being with, with wings and feathers. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it is the face of a deceased family member and they are there bringing comfort. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, the, the physical mind, the, the conscious rational mind looks at that and goes, I don't know what box to put this in, this doesn't make sense but it's an experience. And exactly. An example out of the Ozarks would be after the Joplin tornado with the butterfly people. 100%. But you go, I don't know where to put this. You know what, it's okay. We don't have to know where to put everything. Something very- And, and, and that's something I, 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 I want to stress is that that was, that was an instant that so so often as you say we, we want those boxes um and in a way it was kind of surprising but in a very positive way that there was a very broad acceptance of that mm -hmm. and in in embracing it to the point that it became a symbol around town yes uh, but butterflies everywhere and and um, people, if, if you didn't know this, that story, you would have no idea why, why there were butterflies everywhere and represented everywhere. Um, but it was very refreshing because you didn't get a backlash of it's got to fit in this box or that box. Um, um, you know, it didn't have to be, you know, it, it wasn't. It didn't have to be an angel. It didn't have to be some sort of ghost or this or that. It was just the butterfly people, whatever that is, and it's and they served a per they served a very positive purpose, um, and uh, it, that kind of a broad acceptance and acknowledgement is something that you don't see a lot in our Chinese bots world. <laughs> you don't, and I. I, I would, this is a, just an off the top of my head analysis. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I think that our desire to create these boxes uh, rather than simply acknowledge that something happened, uh, mm -hmm. our, our need to create these structures, our need to create doctrine and dogma around these particular structures is 
a very interesting luxury. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and something that was particularly notable about Joplin, and I've seen it on a, on a microcosm in, in cases where, for example, if an individual family suffers tragedy, or in this case, a huge community suffers mass tragedy at once, at some point, your brain goes, you know what? My need to make sense of everything, um, my need to put my ego in the middle of it, my, my need to be in control, my need to have uh, uh, a, a strong doctrinal or dogmatic opinion about this, I realize that isn't necessary and that's not important and that is not needed right now. So I'm just gonna set that aside because I do not have the luxury I need to do. I need to take care of people. I need to initiate triage. I need to respond. I need to help. And there's a, it's it's so, mm, it is dichotomy. It is dualistic in the sense that in the face of extreme tragedy, we oftentimes see the best of humanity come forward. Yeah. Well, and I found it so positive that it, 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 it never developed that dogmatic response. Um, no, no. In that case. there didn't have, just didn't have to be an explanation per se. Um, and and, and whom, whomever the butterfly people are, they may have manifested themselves in such a way that there's no way to put them in a box. It, exactly. And, 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 and I guess, you know, the, the long and short of it is, I, I think that is, that's what came through with the accounts from the children who saw them. And, you know, to the last, you know, to the very last account none of them were uh, ascribed any dogmatic um, characterization to them um, they were not angels they were not ghosts they were not this or that they were the butterfly people um, mm -hmm. and every single child several dozen that recounted this in the hours afterwards uh, to first responders etc describe them as the butterfly people. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and, <clears throat> and and it also it does have roughly speaking um, a very almost fey or shifter quality in the sense mm -hmm. of in the, uh, of uh, human like beings but with in this case the characteristics of butterflies mm -hmm. and and being described as almost appearing to be made of light yes and it's it is it is one of those things of <clears throat> it is, heads up i'm going off the rails um it is, what's new <laughs> i know it's it's a weekly occurrence, um, sometimes multiple times a week, but it is one of the one of those things. The actual experience when one does experience whatever you want to call it, this these mm -hmm. otherworldly moments, it it is heightened, and within the structure of the moment, it makes sense even if after you try to describe it later, the things don't make sense. Right. There, there is a cohesion there that sometimes doesn't fit into words, which kind of goes back to the idea of the Celtic tradition not being written. It really does. And I think, I, I can't help, this wasn't what I was going off the rails on, um, but... <laughs> But it really, I can't help but imagine for a moment, you know, uh, uh, mm, aging 
Druid priest standing on the threshold of the Celtic world being assimilated by Roman Christianity. Mm -hmm. And the tradition of a precise oral history, uh, oral tradition overlapping over genetic memory and the, the, these men and women lamenting the loss, lamenting the fact that their world was dying and there was nothing that they could do to stop it. And looking at the, the, this new literary tradition and in all likelihood not seeing a way, not seeing a way across the bridge, not seeing a way uh, through the water, so to speak, that, right. that this was, was that their everything that they held dear was not going to continue. And it's heartbreaking to turn back our own ancestral memory and experience that with them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, knowing two things one that a great deal of that lore was indeed lost that their their worst fears were realized but that something else happened that um the, the literary military and um authoritarian structures could not have imagined which is that the celtic peoples were going to take words and they were going to put words on paper and they were going to become conceivably the most lyrical and poetically literate people of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were going to give us in, in essence, the, the heart of this tradition through generations of extraordinary and eloquent and powerful writers. Very true. I mean, it's 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 triumph in the end. Um, talk about a talk about a flanking maneuver around the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> the uh, I'm 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 doing <laughs> I'm drawing a line from Bryson Gedrix to James Joyce. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> <sighs> and Dylan Thomas. Yeah, can't yeah. quite forget Dylan Thomas. No, no, and and W. B. Yeats. Yes. I, and I, I know you're you're quite the Yates fan, so <laughs> I do I do appreciate WB Yates immensely. And uh, <laughs> um, freebie book recommendation: uh, Celtic Twilight is my favorite work of his. In, in part because it's short, but it's very powerful, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, and it's pithy. That's the word for the day. Pithy. It's, uh, it says everything that it needs to say. And, and what is so funny, and I mm, just throwing this out there, there used to be a fantastically curated Ozarks and Heritage bookstore at Silver Dollar City down, down the way uh, mm -hmm. across from the Funnel Cakes, adjacent to the saloon, just saying. <laughs> And uh, I bought my copy of W.B. Yeats' Celtic Twilight in that storm. There's a bit of irony. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I also bought my copy of James Joyce, The Dubliners <laughs> in that storm. <laughs> like I said, it was excellently curated. Yeah, I would not have expected that. <laughs> But since you brought, you know what, since you brought up Silver Dollar City. Yes. How about we segue mm -hmm. into um, 
the Ozarks as it has um, kept alive some of the ideas of Celtic magic. I think that's a, first of all, it's a rich body of, uh, of work. It is interesting to dig into because again, our, <laughs> our my um, Christian traditions over the centuries have largely stripped the, uh, the allowance of public magic out of the mm -hmm. town square. But right. in, a, in a particularly agrarian and mountain societies, the magic is still there. Mm -hmm. And you, it, I find it so interesting. It gets associated, I'm, I'm talking about early 20th century, et cetera, being associated, the same thing that happened in Europe, being associated with backwardness, being associated with uh, rural peasantry who don't know what they're talking about, being associated with uh, you know, the things that you leave behind, the stuff that you don't bring with you to town. Um, and at the same time, there is that, that through line, um, of course, one of our favorite uh, <laughs> anthropologist writers, Vance Randolph, documented it heavily. Yes. Getting published uh, in 1946 with Ozark Superstitions and Magic. And now, um, so many years hence, it's very easy for us uh, so I'm not talking about you and I, uh, for people to be like, oh, I would have been Vance Randolph reporting this sort of thing without realizing he really had to get dirty, basically, mm -hmm. um, in order not only to get the stories, but that his career was heavily tainted uh, and his career was at the time heavily diminished by mm -hmm. this work. It, it it really was in, in his notoriety and and uh, elevation of respect really came much later um, and to be honest more so after his death sort of the the old adage about the artist who was impoverished in life and then became a master after he died um, very similar. Um, but um, the uh, one of our source um, articles that you, for this week was uh, was by Paul Brewster and actually appeared in the Ozark, uh, the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, uh, summer of 1950. It's quite an old article, but um, titled "An Ozark Superstition and Its World Affinities," and he talks about. Um, Ozark's uh, quote image uh, magic, but basically it's conjuring and uh, what most people would associate with voodoo with puppets or witches dolls, etc. But since you brought up Randolph, he uh, he references um, his discussion around an account from Vance Randolph, um, yeah. <clears throat> and. Uh, Randolph wrote in um, Ozark Superstitions, so I once knew a man who spent half an hour every evening uh, playing with a witch's doll, which was dressed to resemble a local woman who could do things. I find that interesting because the notion, you know, referring to someone who could do things is something that I'm very familiar with that is usually connotated with someone with gift. Um, I, you know, I've just heard that so many times over the years. Uh, it continues, time after time, he would thrust the little image into the fireplace until the feet touched the glowing embers and then uh, uh, snatch it out again. The expression on his face was most unpleasant. I am quite uh, indifferent to the ordinary superstitions of the hill folk. I visit graveyards at night, which again is something interesting that, you know, 
it's bad luck to visit the graveyard at night. I love to do that myself. Uh, he continues. <laughs> uh, he continues. Uh, shoot cats on occasion. Have sassafras wood without a trimmer, and yet something akin to horror uh, gripped me as I watched the witch master's sadistic uh, foolery. I should not care to have that man burning a poppet wrapped in my undershirt. Yes. In that scene, most people would associate with Caribbean uh, voodoo. Very true, very true. Uh, but not necessarily, not no. necessarily in terms of its indigenous origin. And this, that paragraph jumped out to me ages ago. I do uh, quote it with full source citations on State of the Ozarks, on mm -hmm. uh, my voodoo, art voodoo and magic article in the Ozarks, mm -hmm. on stateofthosarks.net. Um, with the photos are mine, by the way, including the mummified sparrow. Yes, I remember that. Throw that out there. Um, but there is something I, I want to dig into this. This really speaks. Of course, this is this is from. Of course, it's from Vance Randolph's Bozark Superstitions book. Uh, but it's specifically on the chapter on power doctors. Yeah. And these were individuals who, predominantly men, uh, who were essentially anti-witch witches. Right, right. Um, which, again, is it goes along with... Um, Hoodoo and voodoo that you know you would you you would um, employ a hoodoo to counter another hoodoo. You would, and we we've seen uh, actually court records from the St. Charles area in regards mm -hmm. to to that very thing. And of course, if you want to see a dramatic representation of uh, countering. Um, the supernatural with the supernatural please see the tv show series the supernatural which episode all of them <laughs> true <laughs> i'm i'm a huge fan um actually yeah but Same. the 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 interesting thing first of all i, I want to dig in they, they reference image magic what mm -hmm. is what is your definition of what they're calling image magic? Basically, um, uh, a poppet, uh, because um, in th this type of tradition, you, you usually either have um, fetish, what's usually referred to as a fetish bag or fetish bowl, or um, some sort of image. He's calling it image magic, but um, as Randolph um, referred to it as a, as a pop, but it's a, usually a doll of some sort, some representation of person. Um, if if it's made just to resemble that person, um, it's more imitative or sympathetic um, form of the magic. Um, uh, if you incorporate something from the person or something that they have held or owned, uh, it, it's a more intimate form of it. Um, I think he refers to it as contagious um, yes. Im uh, image magic. Um, and that's why you often hear, and, and it follows through with the voodoo tradition as well, that you know, a piece of someone's hair or nail clippings or a piece of their clothing, that kind of thing, so that, um, say, in the uh, account that Randolph gave, uh, it appears that the puppet was just dressed to resemble the woman if, if perhaps it had a, a piece of her, a dress of hers or something, and, and wrapped it in it, it. The idea would be it would perhaps be more powerful. Um, uh, particularly in the idea of 
causing severe harm or death to somebody um, is usually how that would go. Um, but there's a, if for anyone thinking, well, this doesn't have anything to do with the Celts, um, it, it is interesting that um, in particular, um, the form of the image or the poppet and how it's made um, varies based on the part of the kind of, of the world it came, you know, people came from. And for instance, um, Scottish puppets would be made from clay. Yes. And instead of being burned or pricked with a pen, which we associate with voodoo so much, um, they would be put in running water until they dissolved. Right. Uh, and it, it, the idea is that the, this form of magic is to a degree, first of all, it's ancient, to a degree yes. it is near ubiquitous in terms of the ancient world, mm -hmm. which does imply that there's something to it. Yes. And at the same time, there are mm, unique aspects from differing cultures. Yes. Um, another aspect that, that was also uh, of the, the British Isles uh, Celtic groups that, that, other than the Scots, tend to be more Southern, uh, Cornwall and, and Wales, um, they would use iron pins or nails, either in the image or um, uh, in Britain, would use uh, candle magic um, and put the iron pins in the candle and burn it. Yes. And the idea is when the pin fell, it would inflict the harm upon the person it was intended to. Ironically, I've seen articles and photos float around of these candles um, and being ascribed to as being an alarm clock. Mm. <laughs> uh, saying, oh, people knew how long it, they, they would burn down and the, the, the nail would drop and, 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 and hit the, the uh, the candle holder and wake wake you up. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not what that is. <laughs> that's not what they're doing. Uh, it <laughs> might wake up the might wake up the the uh, the practitioner, but it, <laughs> it's not what it was intended for. <laughs> and I think that's really really interesting. And of course, uh, iron. Iron has a great deal of magical symbolism associated, as well as a sense of protection against the Fae. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes protection against the Fae is also conflated with protection against bad luck. Against bad luck, um, or witchcraft in general. Yes. And, and particularly as time went on. Right. And, and something that does seem to happen as the, mm, as the, the centuries march on is more and more time elapses between you know the, the traditions of the old world and the settlement of the new world that the the doing of the thing continues but the nuances of why or the association we have, we might transition from and i think we do transition from the concepts of the old gods into yeah. the concepts of the fae into and what? The, yeah and what and into the concepts of uh of um witchcraft mm -hmm. and then finally to simply luck good or bad yeah w whatever seems more comfortable to the particular age i think and and as as the the old knowledge gets slowly eroded what 
remains really powerful is the idea that there's something very significant here. You know, why, why, do, why do we have uh, horseshoes over our doors? Why, why do we throw pennies in wishing wells? And right. there are mm, a very valid reasons why this is continued, but there's something about it seeping into our psyche mm -hmm. and then being, being passed ancestrally and as a, as a mm, larger zeitgeist, really, that it's simply a knowing, even though we don't know why we know it and we don't know from whence we know it, <laughs> but we know it. Exactly. I, I do find interesting, though, that um, the concept of actually um, causing a murder through this kind of magic seems to be more of a relatively more modern concept. Um, uh, the first recorded case of it, of it being attempted is actually in the um, in the Anglo-Saxon Charter of the late 10th century. So this is mm, still, you know, just in, in terms of Western civilization, a, a pretty dramatic pedigree of mm, murder by puppet. Yes, um, but uh, by the time you get to the 15th century, we are, um, uh, of course, Roger uh, Bolingbroke, who um, is, was pretty infamous, was actually found kill, guilty of um, making um, a doll as part of a plot to kill the king. Um, I'm trying to remember which king it was now. Um, I want to say Henry IV, but I'm, I may be wrong. Um, and uh, he, he was ended up uh, executed, actually hanged, drawn, and quartered as a consequence. Um, Which really, really speaks to how seriously this was taken during that era. Yes, and, but, it, but it, it continued to um, uh, be, be an issue. In fact, in 1538, uh, a wax image of a baby pierced with pins was found and thought to have been an attempt on the life of um, infant Prince Edward, uh, Henry yes. VIII's son. Um, and then later, um, there was an attempt used with image magic against Queen Elizabeth. Yes. And then also, Another one um, directed against uh, James the Sixth, or and uh, and his wife, uh, thought to actually have been uh, backed by his brother, who was hoping that maybe he could uh, eliminate James before he had a son, and so that he could take the throne of Scotland. Which <laughs> is, is such a fascinating aspect. Of course, many things in English and consequently American society were shaped mm -hmm. by King James. Yes, yes. And so the, the idea of, of this, you know, being, you know, Basically, the modern era, you know, on the on the brink of the modern era, is, is a little odd. You just don't think about it. You don't, and and again, I think that this really speaks into the knowing. You know that you know, but yeah. you don't know why you know. And I also find it fascinating, and, and to me, this is a. Uh, an interesting pulling back the curtain on the fact that when you're dealing with mm, much more ancient traditions and folk magic, there is a, a ubiquitousness to it that sometimes is shocking. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I find it interesting in the, 
I'd say it was it reasonably fair to say beginning with films in the 1920s uh, and continuing up through the, the probably the 50s, if not a little bit later, there was, you know, the mm, easy boogeyman, quote unquote, was voodoo. Yeah. And that's that's ignoring the fact that these very similar practices that were not identical, but certainly are very similar in terms of powerful folk magic uh, have been used by uh, uh, English and European forebears and then largely lost due to modernism or progress. And I put both of those in quotes. <clears throat> And then suddenly it shows back up in a, albeit a slightly different form. And it's like, ah, I'm so scared. It reminds me of uh, the meme that has the two kids huddled in the corner because they're afraid of the rabbit that's staring at them. Yeah. That, that meme that goes around. That tends to be what that reminds me of. I have a huge respect and appreciation for hoodoo and voodoo. Uh, and, and I think it also, in, in some cases, could really speak to the fact that uh, your mm, I don't know, <clears throat> more peasant class Celts uh, who suddenly found themselves as private landowner Celts in Appalachia in particular and later the Ozarks mm -hmm. shared between the between the fact between their their mounting dislike and sometimes ancestral hatred for authoritarian structure, their closeness to the land and their ancestry of folk magic all heavily contributed to, to the reality that the, in many cases, and of course there are of course, dramatic exceptions, but in many cases, the Scots Irish and the Welsh and the uh, early American settlement Irish and the uh, Cornish and <laughs> you know fill in the blind um, affiliated incredibly well, particularly with the Cherokee. In many mm -hmm. cases, uh, other indigenous peoples, and, and in some cases, uh, also with the. Uh, African-American population mm -hmm. in the, within these spaces. And that, coming back to the fact that in the Dark Ozarks, there are no easy answers. We think of these people groups as being highly separate. In some cases, they were not. That's true. They, they, they were not necessarily, and, and, and were more, more similar in some aspects than others as well. But, um, but this idea, this tradition, what we may may surprise some people is that one, that there is a corollary that a lot uh, in Native American um, tribes of use of image uh, images in magic, um, which of course is a completely separate tradition. But so the concept was already in North America uh, yeah. when the settlers got here. But uh, one thing that may surprise some people is that this very, this very concept with puppets was actually um, involved with the Salem witch trials that several uh, people who were accused and um, most that were accused of using puppets were executed, save one that she uh, ended up not being executed uh, basically because she was pregnant. And by the time she delivered the baby, the hysteria had settled down. Mm. But um, that's an aspect of the witch trials at Salem that you don't hear about much is the use of puppets. Um, so definitely you're in a very puritanical community in the 1690s, you had um, these practices going on, which would go back to, to their roots in the British Isles. 
Um, and and just uh, so people don't think this this was just being used say in areas like the Ozarks in the early 1900s. Um, it continued in the British Isles as well. In fact, there um, a a wax puppet of President McKinley was found um, at the American Embassy in London in 1900 or 1901. So <laughs> yeah, not yeah. sure why, but but uh, so those things, um, you know, continued and probably continue to this day. I, I think so. And in something that I found fascinating in that 1950s article by uh, Mr. Brewster was the fact that he references and he notes that this type of magic is uh, is going on in urban environments, but mostly under people's noses. Yes, yes, that it's um, in, in some ways a little more openly practiced in, in rural areas like the Ozarks, but it, it, it goes on everywhere. It does. And th there was a couple of things as, as, as you were referencing several, several moments uh, that really jumped out to me. One of them is jumping into middle America for a moment with uh, indigenous lore, a, mm -hmm. a note on essentially supernatural water beings mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> was the Lakota mythology surrounding a, a mighty water snake called Unsigila that this, uh, first of all, and I find snakes fascinating and y'all are gonna have to, you know, deal with my um, disclaimer, know what kind of snake it is before you proceed, et cetera, et cetera. This is an important part of our um, our natural world don't kill snakes indiscriminately. You might end up yeah. causing a snake problem if you do. Um, black snakes are good. Copperheads take away from them, uh, so on and so forth. You get the idea. Let's get but, rid of rodents, etc. <laughs> yes, uh, that is not the tradition that I grew up with, and that's not the tradition, uh, long-standing tradition from my uh, my my ancestry in Southern Iowa, and uh, I respect both. Uh, I also, I don't think that we can truly wrap our heads around um, something that the, the early settlers, and for example, and would have been here as well, that the early settlers in Southern Iowa coming into that tall grass prairie with a lot of water. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that we can really wrap our heads around the fact that there were many uh, freshly planted homesteads and farms that were mm -hmm. literally infested with snakes. True. I mean, and being uh, cautious in, in that regard, particularly at times with no doctors, no medicine, and and in days before anti-venom, better safe than sorry. <laughs> So it's, you know, and even in the, in the 1920s, there was a, a patch of hay ground that was not very far from where my grandparents actually retired, quote unquote, retired um, their retirement. My grandparents' retirement home was like on three acres on top of a hill. Um, but the, the hay field, uh, several ways, several farms over along the ridge was interestingly enough, and of course my grandpa was 70 when I was born, but he had hayed that as a as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And this was before equipment. Uh, you were haying with pitchforks. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa, who hated snakes, whether they were venomous or not, uh, said every single time he stuck his pitchfork into that hay, he'd have a rattlesnake coiling its way around the pitchfork handle coming at him. Mm. And he said that, you know what, field, 
was infested with that you know what snakes <laughs> he was he did not enjoy his his time hay in that space and, um, uh, and i don't blame him. And, and even the non-venomous snakes affected our, our mm, early settler forebears uh could easily have been you know <laughs> you, you put your sod house together and suddenly you find yourself picking um snakes out of your you know kitchen I'll dishes yeah yeah <laughs> literally <laughs> and and that was actually one of the reasons of waxing long but my grandpa was part of my my celtic ancestry so mm -hmm. that is the tie-in but uh, grandpa did a lot of things he uh, was up on high rises in des moines as a uh, you know building cement forms he was a cowboy in some cases very dangerous situations out in the dakotas uh he was a lifelong farmer there's a lot of things he would not go into the mines would not go into the mines not going to the mines he did not want to go underground in the 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 working conditions and the the level of danger the potential of cave-in etc he went down once and they had a big open pit this is near lucas iowa which is up highway mm -hmm. 65 highway 65 runs through the ozarks you can follow highway 65 out of the ozarks north you will get to lucas lucas used to be a big coal mining town that's where all my family is from big open pit mine with uh with ladders going straight down through the mm -hmm. through the sod into the mines and uh one night it was a it was a night shift <clears throat> you climb climb down as you're climbing down you just kept hearing odd noises in the dark yeah not really knowing <laughs> what they were and not having enough light to be able to to tell what they were and get down there and then start climbing back up out of the out of the mine with daylight mm -hmm. and what they've been hearing in the dark right next to them in the ladders uh in that incredibly thick uh soil was snakes no thanks. <laughs> and, and I'm not particularly scared of snakes, but yeah, that 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 would be a little creepy. And they uh, the 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 sod cut uh, was abrupt enough that the the snakes were falling out of the soil. <laughs> That's quite an image. <laughs> yes, and Grandpa's like, nope, not doing it. So with, within that, the, the imagery of this giant water snake in Lakota mythology, polluting the water, flooding the land with salt, interesting tie in there. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately, uh, Unsigila is defeated by twins who mm -hmm. much like um, uh, Smog, the, the the, the dragon in Tolkien, mm -hmm. uh, they find Unsigila's weak spot and uh, <clears throat> had managed to kill it. And uh, the, the scorching sun uh, dries up the, the giant water snake's flesh, ultimately forming the Dakota Badlands. I like it. I like the Badlands. Um, I do too. It's, it's 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 beautiful i um uh, i think i i i i may have told you before that um talking about the water snake maybe makes me think of uh experience my dad had mm -hmm. um with a uh, water moccasin um in in water he was working on low water gap on our farm and a neighbor who um, had grown up there like two miles away um, was was standing on the low water bridge talking to him while he's working and dad has his he's facing downstream working on the gap and so 
and there had been a lot of uh, rain and it was, the water was high and had, and that's why the gap had washed out. And so he's standing there in waders and, and so in hip deep water and uh, our neighbor Ray says he kind of looked up just in time to see this water moccasin floating down, you know, coming down on the water and literally slides down into the the waiter. <laughs> Dad's waiter. And um, Ray, although, although he grew up in Southwest Missouri, he had to draw like he was from Southern Arkansas. And um, he'd always say, I'm not sure who came out of that boot first. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and oh. so the the i think there's just something about water snakes that aside from the fact they tend to be venomous um <laughs> <laughs> that is just unnaturally unsettling it, it is and, well and i think part of it is the when you're when you're in the water you are at a disadvantage yes it it is it is a boundary space it um, is a boundary space very much and it's uh you know visibility if it's a if it's a not a extremely clear ozark stream and we have both in the ozarks we have a lot mm -hmm. uh, of different types of of ways to interact with water in the in the Ozarks and a number of farm creeks are not dissimilar uh, to the farm creeks that I grew up with, which is right. in some cases limited visibility and you can't see the bottom. You don't know mm -hmm. what's there. And <clears throat> it is, it is innately creepy. It's in the in the same category really as, as alligators or crocodiles. It's, yeah. <laughs> You know. Well, it's pretty much as dangerous. It's just whether it's by teeth or venom. Right, right. And of course, there are a number of, uh, of water snakes that are not venomous, um, but certainly the, the proliferation of, as you mentioned, water moccasins, uh, which are, are is, it's cotton mouth, um, right. uh, egg kistradon. And they are, they are, venomous uh, they are notably uh, potent in terms of their venom mm -hmm. and in many cases they are mm, shy um, but I'm going to get in trouble with the, the the herpetology department here in some cases they are not shy uh, particularly if they are defending their young very true I mean and 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 that's, I mean, that's, that's fair. That's natural instinct for most species. It is. It's, it's perfectly understandable. Um, just not something you want to have happen when you're swimming in the lake. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in terms of creepy things in the water, uh, there, there was a uh, hmm, particular bit of Scottish folklore that I wanted to talk about briefly. And that is True. the blue men of the minch. Yes. Um, it's page 27 of our notes. The supernatural, this is uh, from lentech.com backslash watermythology.html. Um, but they're, they're sea creatures uh, living in the underwater caves in the Minch, which is straight between Lewis, Long Island, and the Shant Islands near Scotland. Now, th there was something really interesting. The blue men look like humans, but with blue skin. Mm hmm. They, they they have a siren-like quality, uh, infamous for swimming alongside passing ships and attempting to wreck them by conjuring storms. So there's a conjure aspect, um, possibly an ancient deity aspect to that, um, possibly a connection with Manan and Maclear. Uh, they're, they lure sailors into the water. There's our siren-like aspect. Now, here's the one that really gets me. If the captain wanted, quote, if the captain wanted to save a ship, 
He had to finish their rhymes and solve their riddles and always make sure he got the last word. How is this not like the Welsh Mary Lloyd? Very much so. I mean, again, I, I mean, know. it, you know, it, to me, it, 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 uh, it says that there that both of the, both of those myths come from an older tradi tradition that's been lost to time. Yes, and well, although I also thought it was um, um, interesting, of, of course they are, uh, and, and several of the Celtic water um, entities are are basically likened to the concept of mermen. Um, yeah. But this one also some uh, equate them with fallen angels. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And I'm not sure why, I'm not, not sure why per se, but. Right. There is a really, and I'm, I'm gonna reference the BB-8. There is a really interesting bit of lore about the Fae. And, Something that you do begin to see with, I'll reference Irish mythology specifically because I'm talking about Yeats. Uh, something that we do see with Irish mythology really beginning in the eighth, ninth century with the, the monastic scribes mm -hmm. is that the mythological cosmology of Ireland suddenly becomes uh, a, uh, a point of contention because they're attempting to fit it into the Christian cosmology right. uh, of, uh, of Catholicism. And so there was the big question, how did the Fae fit? And there was a conflation of the Fae with the angelic host, but then they added something I don't think that this specifically is in connection with the Blue Men, but there is the potential of some contextual crossover. And the idea was that when the war took place, the heavenly war took place, and Satan and his angels rebelled against God, and there was the, the, the great <clears throat> um, separation and uh, Lucifer and the angels fell from heaven. Mm -hmm. There, and this is not unlike the war in Missouri, um, that there was a, a band of angels who said, that's nice, we just don't wanna pick sides. <laughs> We're not gonna fight on either one. And that, that God threw them out of heaven, but, that they weren't evil exactly mm -hmm. and so he basically he cast them into to earth mm -hmm. uh, to exist within their own space on earth and they become the fey they become the the tuaha de Dalen. and uh, of course the mm, cosmological or the mm, religious mm, origins of the tuaha de Dalen vastly different because there was no right. um, Catholic superstructure in which to place them during that time. Right. <laughs> but it is interesting and it's it's fascinating in the sense because that does speak to aspects of the Seely Court, of the mm -hmm. High Fae, uh, these magical, powerful, capricious, but not evil beings that appear right. in many forms and are associated with the elements, in some cases, many cases associated with water, in many cases associated with the, the underworld that is not hell. That's a very important distinction in Celtic uh, lore. Right. And it also it associated with great beauty, associated with melancholy and the lament, the idea that they're lamenting heaven. Um, but they're not demons. It's very, very fascinating. And it really ties into an, an interesting aspect of much of Celtic lore, 
which does also speak to some of our legends and lore here in the Ozarks, that they are quite capricious. They like to play tricks. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes those tricks can be deadly. Very true. And maybe a little, you know, more little literal representation can, with the Ozarks connection are the blue men of Blowing Cave. I think that's an interesting, an interesting crossover. I really, really do. I mean, it's not, it's not a body of water, but it's a, a cave. It's that boundary space. Um, mm -hmm. And it for is. those that aren't familiar, the, the lore goes that, you know, early 1900s, I believe that people exploring Blowing Cave in nor Northern Arkansas um, encountered men with blue skin. Yes. yes. And it seems to have the supposition that maybe they, they weren't quite typical men per se. Right. But vastly different. We're, we're very different than the, uh, the blue man in lumber country. Right. Here, sorry, yeah. Who was described essentially as a as a as a bigfoot. As bigfoot with with uh, black fur with a blue hint in sunlight. But yeah, the the blue men in the in the blowing cave are supposed to be, you know, blue skinned men. Yes. But appear to be men. Um, um, and then when you follow them, that they they couldn't find where they had receded to in the cave as if they had disappeared, um, which gives almost a, a fey or some sort of supernatural connotation um, in, in, the, in the telling of it. Um, it so that's kind of interesting. Another one um, that I wanted to kind of cover actually is another Scottish um, myth is the ash rays. Yes, I was really fascinated by the ashrays. Yeah, uh, also known as water lovers, and they're they're translucent uh, water creatures, often mistaken for sea ghosts. Uh, they can be male or female. Can be found only underwater, um, and completely nocturnal. Um, you don't come across them during the day. Um, and if they're captured and exposed to sunlight, they supposedly melt uh, with only a puddle of water to remain. Um, almost, almost a little akin to vampire lore, <laughs> modern <laughs> vampire lore. Um, but um, I do find that interesting and, and um, it, it, it reminds me of Celtic lore of, of um, the dead in the rivers, uh, which of course is part of the inspiration for Tolkien in, in the Lord of the Rings, um, that as well as his experience in World War I. But. And, and you're specifically, I'm assuming you're, you're referencing the dead marshes. Yes. Yes. Uh, but so it's, and and you know with with the ashrays there there's aspects that are, on a purely mm, physiological standpoint um, jellyfish mm -hmm. you know seeing jellyfish seeing jellyfish remains on the beach um, those types of things but on, on a on a more metaphysical level. There's something really evocative. There's something really powerful and, and something very consistent, albeit mm, frustrating in terms of analysis, which is the Fae refuse analysis. Right. Uh, it, it refuse to be defined, basically. Yes. And so, oh, we, you know, so. I think it's not unrealistic to say that individuals experienced something that, as we spoke before, mm -hmm. 
was something that within the within the state of space they knew that they were experiencing the other they were experiencing something else they might not be able to define it they know they were seeing something but more than just seeing they knew they were truly experiencing something that mm, they had passed through the looking glass so to speak they had had gone in some way briefly beyond but also that if you and th this is not dissimilar to uh, to leprechaun gold uh, that you finally get it you you capture it and the, there's something very powerful in terms of metaphysical lesson with this you capture it you own it you you uh you know you you experience authority over it and there's a dimensional shift and it's gone and yeah the the only thing that you're left with is the knowledge that it happened but no capacity to take it home and prove to your neighbors uh that it had occurred which, which of course is a bit of the quandary with everything in the paranormal um it is you know um these the, these kind of myths and, and creatures also um, make me think. You know, in the Ozarks, there there's a a preoccupation in, in the lore of river creatures, river monsters, um, um, almost out of proportion to the bodies of water. If that makes sense, there. Um, it does. It we does. have a proliferation of of river uh, monster lore that doesn't seem to fit, it. and I think it kind of goes back to this tradition. Settlers were used to this this motif. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I think that I think that's fair and. Again, you're, you're, you're dealing with lore that speaks on a variety of levels. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at the Grindelow lore, which I can say Grindelow and people who know Harry Potter obviously know what I'm talking about. But, you know, and, and it's very easy to simply dismiss that as a cautionary tale. Tell the kids about the Grindelow. They, they stay away from the water. They don't drown. That's great. Right. And in many cases, I think that's very fair. At the same time, there is the potentiality, and we've talked to a number of people, not specifically about Grindelow's, but uh, individuals who suddenly have found themselves in an other space. And yeah. water is inherently associated with the other space. Mm -hmm. uh, creepily enough, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a lake. It doesn't have to be a river. Sometimes in terms of a uh, you know, variety of non-folk but magic tradition, it could be a bathtub, it could be a, a bowl of water. It could be a lot of things in these regards. So sure. there is that, that association um, that, that, that still just exists within our, within some aspect of our psyche that, that that we we recognize even if we don't know what it is we're recognizing very true very true and um uh, and a lot of the lore not only has to do with with sort of this metaphysical aspect but um war itself in, in Celtic tradition, lots of battles happened in water, in the rivers, um, which doesn't seem to make sense. Um, but again, thinking, speaking more metaphorically for the space, um, and then I have to bring this up because it's one of your favorite um, sayings is that um, 
uh, part of that is where the idea of the cult of the severed head comes from, is often after battle, the, the heads of the enemy were taken to a spring. Yes. They tend to be preserved, um, not only as a show of triumph, but as veneration. Right. Um, and in fact, um, severed heads were often um, in Celtic tradition put on display as decor. Yes, uh, sometimes used as pillows. Yeah, that, that goes just a little further than, than even I'm comfortable with, even with my Celtic background, but you know, that's <laughs> just me. Um, can't, can't imagine it would, be, it would have been terribly comfortable. Um, or, 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 or smelled well. I granted no. whatever preservative oils, but um, and this, you know, probably seems very barbaric to people, but the concept went forward a lot further that um, people may be familiar with um, that during medieval times and even more modern times, um, notorious outlaws and pirates, they would have their head put on a pike, particularly on London Bridge. Yes. Um, and um, although that was done as an example of, you know, don't do this, or this is what happens to you, the idea of doing that really comes from that tradition. It does, <clears throat> it does. And, and even in, in just the aspect that uh, the display of a severed head being social, mm, societally acceptable, mm -hmm. even as late as the 1860s in the Ozarks. Yes. And uh, we're, uh, <laughs> we're looking at you, Mr. Bolin. Um, <laughs> Bolin is, and, and, you know, Bushwhacker at a villa. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and also just the, the, uh, the, the practices of, of the Osage um, in battle and also during the Civil War, um, yes. um, as well as other, you know, um, other participants, uh, uh, Mr. Christian yes. was buried in the, the Newtonia Civil War uh, uh, cemetery. Um, mm -hmm. It's, what uh, an element of this, and we, we seem to see this with the Roman chroniclers in regards to the Celts, that ritualistic decapitation was viewed with horror by the chroniclers simply because it was being practiced by the barbaric Celts, and I put the barbaric Celts in quotes, even though decapitation was not remotely unknown by the Romans. No. And so there was a there's a bit of a double standard, um, sort of the idea that when we do it, we're doing it for positive reasons, you know, that makes sense. But when they do it, oh my gosh, they're barbarians. And I, I think that we certainly we we continue to encapsulate some of our own intrinsic biases in this regard, as well as uh, having having descended from comparatively recent forebears who as in the case of the decapitation of uh, Bolin, our, our local outlaw, are going, there was a price on his head. His body was rotting. It's pragmatic. And there you go. Yeah, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't need to take the whole rotting corpse. <laughs> Just the head. Just the head. And, and it was also, uh, you know, that particular story is, is uh, you know, Alf Bolin is near to my heart because it's near, uh, in terms of proximity, Murder Rocks is right around the corner from my house if I was feeling particularly rambunctious and didn't want to risk getting hit by traffic, I could walk a couple of miles and be there. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, there is a continuity that goes back thousands of years, whether we want to admit it or not. 
It does. And oftentimes we don't want to think about that. It's one of the things I love about Dark Ozarks is that is precisely the kind of things that we think about. Exactly. Agreed. And, you know, um, death itself um, took on a, a, a very a sort of, no pun intended, yeah, the pun is intended, larger than life, um, con, you know, place in Celtic mythology. Uh, including, you know, you know, um, death goddesses or or death almost be, being personified as a god. Yes, there's there's a surprising amount of personification of death. The uh, Celtic deities, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the Morrigan, is probably the most visceral and well known. A uh, uh, triad female triad of death goddess mm -hmm. which uh, mm, again is is reasonably reasonably well known and th there is an aspect that is mm, I'm going to get in trouble here in terms of my technicality but to a certain aspect there is there is a mother maiden crone quality to the triad goddesses yes no i i think i think that i i i i think there is um um uh, whether it's overt or alluded to and you know the the morigu uh i really i first of all i can't help but think that uh, on some level, Queen Boudicca was invoking the Morigu um, at, at various points in her brief career of vengeance against Rome, particularly when she was burning down London. Um, but there is something mm, deeply evocative about this. Um, you know, historian Peter Beresford Ellis in the Dictionary of Irish Mythology, published in 1987, says that the Morrigan was, quote, the major goddess of war, of death, and slaughter, embodying all that was perverse and horrible among the supernatural powers. That is evocative, to say the least. It is, and it's, you know, not mincing words um, and not, not putting a you know, rose-colored explanation on things. Um, and, you know, it comes through in, in different ways and, and, and it's out of that tradition that eventually um, uh, Halloween arises. It does. And, and interesting to make these points of comparison, um, you know, the, the, especially in terms of war and conflict, the Morrigan is so powerful as to ultimately defeat Ireland's greatest hero, Cucullin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, and if you, if you see um, artistic renditions of the death of Cucullin, there'll be a, a crow or a raven perched on his shoulder. That is, the manifestation of the goddess mm -hmm. uh, watching him die yes and it's uh it's extraordinarily powerful in terms of its visual imagery but something that has been is consistent and i think it's while it's consistent it's often been overlooked once in a while hyper idealized and then dropped is that our Appalachian and our Ozarks fighting men were predominantly of Celtic ancestry. Mm -hmm. And they knew how to fight. They were good at it. They were very good at it. And uh, when you then handed them uh, you know, weapons of proficiency, which interestingly enough, and I was actually made aware of this through some of the research for tonight's episode, that uh, 
weapon, proficient weapons of war have been a hallmark of Celtic culture mm -hmm. since time immemorial. And in the case of, uh, you know, in Eastern European Celts utilizing the war chariot uh, mm -hmm. to the fact that uh, Celts in the um, 500 BC era, uh, the approximately Latin culture were master weaponsmiths. Mm -hmm. uh, who in many cases were actually selling weapons to Rome, to the Romans. <laughs> yeah. uh, which is ironic. Uh, to our American mountain men with their Kentucky long rifles and their sniper skills. That plus um, something that, you know, some may not be aware of, but, you know, the Celts were basically um horsemen expert yeah. horsemen um and very early had probably the best you know were the best cavalry in the world you know by about 300 bc yes. um and a hallmark of the, the guerrilla warfare in the Ozarks was that so many of the Confederate uh, partisan rangers and bushwhackers were so good on the force that uh, that contributed to the Union not being able to contain them. Correct. Very, very correct. And in the uh... In the years following the Civil War, some of our great outlaw bandits, uh, great outlaws who became uh, household names, these were men and women who were renowned for their horsemanship. And in many cases, albeit not all, uh, but in many cases, these were individuals with Celtic ancestry. Yes, very much so. People like the James Brothers and Bill Starr and so forth. And in the the again as you as you referenced dating back at least well really into time immemorial um you know a thousand bc the the celts uh originally mm -hmm. in the uh far eastern european steppes previously before that um in the in the um indian subcontinent were dealing mm -hmm. with a, a group of people who were horse lords, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to borrow a phrase from Tolkien. Um, I, I think the, the closest, you know, that we can really wrap our heads around, the writers of Rohan, the, the horse lords of the plains. These mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, landlocked Vikings uh, <laughs> on, on horseback rather than uh, rather than sea raiders exactly and and going forward you had people like you know my my grandfather my grandfather Naylor who um before the you know the the phrase from the book came up of horse whisperer um he he was a horse whisperer and and uh, made a living breaking uh, wild horses mm -hmm. uh, and um definitely came from that ancestry so it, it's you know in the blood it is it is and I can't I can't help but make some references some comparisons in terms of the the Celtic influence not only here in the Ozarks but just in terms of unconscious influence on American culture the symbolism of the of the horse, the symbolism of the rider on the horse is mm -hmm. so powerful and in terms of personal sovereignty and in terms of personal agency, the idea that you can get on your horse and you can travel. Very much so. And it, it, it continues today, even in, you know, uh, in, you know, our mechanized transportation uh, with car culture, it's the same, it's the same idea. It's it just a, a steel car versus, you know, steel horse versus a, one of uh, flesh and muscle. It is. And, and I think that 
obviously there's there's plenty of um, socioeconomic reasons that cars and car culture and uh, the infrastructure of the highway system, et cetera, took root. But in the imagination, the representation hasn't changed. It is, yeah. uh, I think, one of the one of the reasons that it it really boomed in terms of its imaginative popularity, and then consequently, as a result of its actual popularity. And and you could argue that the even the you know, the great gangsters and great uh, automobile era outlaws like Bonnie and Clyde speak into this, the idea that you can get in your car and you can get away. You can get in your car, you can go wherever you need to go, you do whatever you want to do. Uh, this is something that, you know, we, we, we look at uh, the 19th century rail traffic, we look at the 19th century steamboat traffic, uh, it's very romantic. It's very interesting. Steamboat traffic was amazing as long as you didn't blow up along the way. Um, mm -hmm. you know, minor things like that. But all of it was mass public transit. You were mm -hmm. going as a group. You did not, you know, an individual did not get in his personal steam engine and drive wherever he wanted to. Yeah. Uh, an individual rarely, I mean, obviously you could have a small boat or a skiff or a raft and play Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, but in terms of just general mass transit, you didn't get in your personal steamboat um, with your family or yourself. You went along with your 250 closest friends um, or you know, <laughs> if they overloaded the boat, um, a thousand, then it blew up because it was too heavy. But the, this idea of personal agency, of personal autonomy, encapsulated into this greater era. It's, it's very interesting. It really is. It, it really is. Just segueing back a little bit to the, um, the idea of the, the goddess of, of death, um, which ultimately kind of gave rise to the notion of Halloween and all of the supernatural connotations around it, including the, the thinning of the veil and so forth. I, I wanted to just mention the idea of the dumb supper. Yes. I, uh, I find it, find it interesting. Um, and um, again, it's, um, you know, it's it's um, a conjuring woman or a wise woman practice uh, originally um, that um, came from the Scottish and Irish tradition and ended up in Appalachia and the Ozarks. Um, but basically, uh, there's just a lot of this divination that is is around women and who they're going to marry. <laughs> I was North noticing North. that, particularly <laughs> and, and particularly teenage girls and yes, which ironically is how the Southern Witch Trails got started uh, as well. Um, but um, and talk about being blown out of proportion, but um, <laughs> but the idea that the dumb supper is that women will have this supper usually at midnight on on halloween um mm -hmm. and um they don't speak that's why it's referred to as the dumb supper so they, they don't it's silence uh, often um a chair is left empty at the head of the table sometimes draped in in uh, black cloth um sometimes uh, they would leave other settings open, chairs open um, for the dead to visit. Um, and um, you, you would only have candles lit, no other light. Um, and in some traditions that the, the, uh, the meal was eaten backwards with dessert first and going backwards uh some traditions were that the women would 
uh, generally pick nine items, almost like a smorgasbord laid out, and they would have to pick nine items, and they could be whatever. Um, but it had to be nine. Had to be nine, and uh, that it would basically the, the the ultimate purpose is to divine who they were going to marry. Um, uh, but I, I like the idea that it, it was a nine, it was nine items because in the water lore, um, there was a bit significance on nine waves, if there were nine waves. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good catch. Um, there's something about that, um, the number nine. Um, and, um, but um, I just find it interesting um, uh, also that they would have dumb cakes uh, or sometimes just dough um, that was mixed with spring water. It goes back again to the springs, you know, that the idea of the divination from the water. Um, yes. And um, ironically, I've 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 had occasion where uh, knowing people who basically had the dumb suppers, but not for the de divination part of it, but um, as a holding the space for ancestral spirits to come through to to visit, and usually yeah. on. Um, so that part of it I have heard before. Um, and then, um, but this, this is something that supposedly, it, it was practiced at least in the mid century in the Ozarks. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's complete. comparatively common in, in a not terribly far removed past. Exactly, you know, within you know, a couple of generations. Um, and, but, um, but I found it interesting with the divination aspect of it, because I've, 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 I've known people who've done the, the suppers, but not, you know, doing it backwards or, or all of that, but a, as a, um, as a means to allow ancestor spirits or ghosts to, to come join the table. And what was, if I may ask, what, what was the result? What did they feel like happened or took place? Um, nothing, nothing that was concrete as far as activity, but just at least the concept of their being acknowledged and welcomed. Um, uh, but they, you know, the, the account, I've heard a couple of different people tell this kind of story. They felt like the ancestors did visit or come through, but I haven't heard anything that gave, you know, concrete, this happened, you know, this moved across the table or we heard this noise or we heard a voice or something like that. Um, almost just that acknowledgement more than anything, <laughs> I think. Um, but I, I have not heard a personal account incorporating the rest of the tradition. I think that's, I think it's fascinating. And I think it can be uh, a really beautiful practice. It, I think so too. Uh, there, there are elements of, of cautionary tale attached to it. Um, Judy Dr. Young recorded one of the stories in, uh, in uh, one of my favorite books that she published, uh, she and her, her late husband, Richard, in which, <clears throat> and this might be based on our, our time frame. this might be a place where we begin to wrap up, but it, mm -hmm. the, the, the story of the dumb supper, the dumb supper, the, uh, uh, the girls uh, do everything perfectly and they they conclude uh suddenly there's a gust of wind uh the appropriate 
flash of lightning, uh, the, 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 the candles blow out, they're pitched in darkness. And for a split second, there is a figure of a man uh, at the table. And then and, and the girls scream and then it's gone. And, but then when they begin cleaning things up, the, the, at the place setting that they had set where the, where the man or the, the apparition had occurred, uh, a knife was missing. Interesting. And then time goes on uh, um, several years later uh, and uh, uh, the girl falls in love with a uh, um, traveler man from out of town. <clears throat> and let's see if I can tell this correctly. Uh, they, uh, they fall in love. They're, they're married and on the, the I, it, it, evocatively enough on the night of their wedding, um, you know, after their wedding night, <clears throat> they're unpacking and uh, she unpacks her, her, her dowry essentially and has the, uh, uh, the silverware with the missing, with, with the space with the missing knife. Mm -hmm. And her her recently minted husband um, suddenly turns white, walks to his his uh, valise, opens it up, pulls the knife out, <laughs> and says, "You are the witch who dragged me through hell that Halloween night," and stabs her. <laughs> oh my. Interesting. <sighs> Be careful what what you uh, what you divine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that may, that may be a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> we have so much more to talk about this subject. We may make it two episodes before the before the season is over. That's that's very true. We we certainly we certainly could. In the meantime, don't forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkosarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping to bring the Dark Arts to everyone. On the next episode, we are going to be discussing mirror magic. Catch the Dark Arts podcast on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or about any other podcast platform. Thank you to everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks. <laughs>